Hey, what is going on guys and welcome to another signal processing tutorial. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. Uh, just as a quick disclaimer, uh, the filter that we created in the previous example is not ideal for showing how uh, the filter is attenuating a signal. However, I want to show you that the filter that we created uh, worked, so we're going to stick with it for now. Uh, just quickly, if we were looking for something that would be more ideal to show how the filter was working, it'd probably be better to use a higher order filter, just something that attenuates a bit faster. Uh, so the program we're going to be using today is Simulink. Now Simulink is part of MATLAB, and if you're a student at a university or at school, I guess, you can get it for, for free. So feel free to go ahead and download that now. It's really good for creating say control systems or testing things like our filters here today. Okay, so let's quickly go through all of our components. Firstly, we have a sine wave generator. Now if you double click on that, you can get to the settings for it. We are generating a frequency of 10 kilohertz, and this has to be in radians per second, so it is multiplying by 2 pi. And then we've chosen a sampling time that will give us a sampling frequency of 200 kilohertz. So okay. And then we have our FDA tool. Now this is a tool which the Digital Signal Processing Toolbox inside Simulink provides to allow you to create filters by inputting a range of desired characteristics. As you can see here, you can choose what type of filter you'd like to create if it's an IIR or FIR, Infinite Impulse Response or Finite Impulse Response, and then the type of filter you'd like to create. You can then simply put in the values for your pass and stop bands and then design the filter. However, today we'll be using the filter we created in the previous example. If you look at this tab here, import filter from workspace, where we can enter the coefficients of the filter we created in the previous episode. For now, let's ignore the filter structure. This will work for us. And in the numerator and denominator, we can put in the values of the coefficients for our filter that we created previously. Lastly, we need to set our sampling frequency. Remember, this is very important that we keep this at 200 kilohertz. After entering our values, we can see the frequency response of our filter shown here. Now, you might be worried about this for now. It doesn't quite look like it's an ideal low-pass filter. However, this is only due to the fact that it's a low-order filter. If we double-click on our frequency response, it will show the point value. So, we can see that at the frequency of 20 kilohertz, so remember that this frequency axis is in kilohertz, not hertz, uh, we can approximately find that when we have a frequency of 20 kilohertz, we have a magnitude of approximately negative 3 dB. That indicates that the filter we've created is operating as expected. The only reason we have the slow attenuation is just due to the fact that it's a first order filter. Lastly, we have a multiplexer here, which just allows us to put two inputs into our scope, which will display the value of our original signal and our filtered signal. We've chosen a very short runtime. This is in seconds, just to show the output wave. Remember, we're talking about waves that are 10 kilohertz, so it's very quick. So a very small window will show it clearly. Now for our first signal, we're expecting this signal to be unattenuated, meaning both signals will look almost identical. There'll only be a slight shift as we remember that passing our signal through a filter causes a delay. Here you can see the blue input line and the yellow input filtered line show that the amplitude of both of the signals are almost identical. There's only a tiny drop off. You also might notice that there's a one sample delay in the output of the filtered signal. Before we look at this 20 kilohertz filtered output, Let's firstly go over what we're expecting to see. Remember that a negative 3 dB frequency drop is the same as multiplying the original signal by 0.707. Thus, if we have a one amplitude wave coming in, we should be able to see a filtered output signal with an amplitude of 0.707. Double clicking the scope, we can see that the yellow filtered output signal is approximately 0.7 times that of the original blue input signal. Lastly, let's take a look at the 40 kHz signal. Now let's quickly return back to the frequency response of our filter to check what the expected value is at 40k. With a negative 7.789536 decibel drop, we're expecting to see an output value approximately 0.4 times that of our input. Let's check that now. Okay, so going in, we can see that our original input wave still has an amplitude of approximately 1. However, our filtered input wave has now been attenuated to approximately 
0 0.4 to 0 0.5 times the original input. Hopefully from this you can see that filtering a signal does not remove it entirely from the system. In fact, the wave is still exactly there. However, it's just been scaled down by whatever the attenuation rate is for that frequency. Now if we were to pick a much higher order degree filter for our original Butterworth, we'd have a much higher attenuation at this point and you might not even be able to see the filtered output wave. Okay guys, uh, so I know this video was a little bit different to usual, uh, but hopefully it gave you a good visual representation of exactly what's happening with our filters. Sometimes you can go through a lot of theory and creating a lot of filters and you never actually see them in action. So hopefully this has given you uh, a taste of that. Also I hope that if you need to create or test filters in the future that uh, you could use something like Simulink. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to let me know with a comment down below. Uh, if you had any problems at all, uh, just leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you. As always guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.